All right, so we've been looking at diffusion uh, across a membrane. Remember, diffusion is where something is going to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. All right, because of energy. High concentration, high energy, unstable, low concentration, low energy, more stable. There's going to be that tendency to move. Now, the membrane's a barrier to that or a potential barrier. Some things can still get across a membrane. Small, nonpolar molecules can move right between the fatty acid tails, right between the phospholipids, and they can go from one side of the membrane to another. When that type of diffusion occurs, that type of diffusion is called simple diffusion. So simple diffusion is where we move directly across the phospholipid bilayer. But there are a lot of other sorts of things that need to get across cell membranes, but they can't get between the tails. They can't get through that nonpolar region. One of those types of things uh, that has to move across cell membranes are ions. So in this example here, we have a sodium ion, Na plus, plus one. If in this environment, it is in a high concentration, and in this environment here, the sodium ions are at a low concentration, the tendency is going to be for the sodium ions to want to move into this environment, but they're not going to be able to get across the phospholipid bilayer. So it's a barrier. Remember we said a phospholipid bilayer is a semi-permeable barrier. So it's permeable to some things that can get across, but not to others. It's restrictive. But they have to have other ways to move across the membrane. So we talked about proteins, membrane proteins. We said some are transmembrane proteins. They go all the way across the membrane from one side to the other. And that section that spans the membrane uh, is typically an alpha helix. Now this alpha helix, which is a little bit bigger over here, remember is made up of amino acids. Amino acids are unique because they have R groups sticking off them. And those R groups can be polar, nonpolar, acidic, or basic. And acidic or basic is meaning Acidic, negative charge, basic, positively charged. Now, the areas of the protein that is near the tails, typically those R groups are nonpolar, sticking off them. So they associate with the tails. But to the inside, the inner part, <coughs> these particular sections can have charge associated with them. So we could have negative charge, the acidic R groups are the positive charged R groups. Uh, and then that can affect what sorts of things can move through these proteins. So these particular proteins here that we're talking about, these transmembrane proteins form a channel across the membrane. These are channels specific for ions. So we call them ion channels. They're going to allow the diffusion of ions from areas of high to low concentration, not directly through the phospholipids, but through the protein itself. So because it's moving through the protein, we call that facilitated diffusion. So it's a type still diffusion, but it's what we call facilitated diffusion. So simple is directly through the phospholipids. Facilitated is through a protein. In this case, the protein is called an ion channel because it's forming a little channel, a little tube, or, uh, through the membrane and ions can move through them. Okay, so that's that's the first thing. So now for our ion channels, ion channels can be somewhat selective. They could be somewhat selective based on size. So the size of the ion channel can allow larger or smaller things through. If you're too big, you're still not going to get through the, the ion channel. So um, it's just like a screen in a window. Certain small things can get through, air molecules and water molecules and really tiny insects, but larger ones can't get through the screen. These holes through the membrane are going to restrict, so only small things can get through. But unlike a screen, uh, these do have charge. So charge of the interior, that's the interior of the channel, can affect what can move through them. So if this channel was positively charged, it wouldn't sodium ion wouldn't like it. All right? It would try to come to this channel here to move through it, but it would pull back. All right? It would be like two same ends of a magnet being pushed together, and they would repel one another. So if it was negatively charged or polar, then they would be able to move through it much easier from one side to the other. So you can have somewhat restriction in the movement across the channel in this way. Channels, though, aren't always open. 
<coughs> they can be open or they may be closed. If this happens, the channel has what we call a gate attached to it. So gates are extensions of this protein that can fold on themselves and actually plug the channel. So now the channel is blocked and nothing can get through. Or they can change shape and open up. So they can go back and forth one way, one way or the other. You can close the channel by closing the gate. You could open the channel by opening the gate. So this extra protein here is called a gate. And we call these the gated ion channels. So gated ion channels then have one of these gates and can be opened or closed. So the next thing is what what opens or closes the gate? How does it know which position to be in? Well, these gated ion channels then fall into one of three categories. We have signal gated, we have charge gated, uh, and we have stress gated. Now, a signal gated ion channel is typically going to have with it another extension of the protein here that is a very specific binding site called a receptor. And we are going to get more into receptors uh, as we talk about cell signaling very soon. Um, but for right now, uh, we're just kind of introducing the, the topic here. So it's part of this protein here. It's a very unique binding site um, that has its own specific size and shape and charge and polarity that, that's unique like a key and a lock uh, to that extent. And then we're going to have some time of signal molecule. So the signal molecule, that's a chemical molecule. And it could be of, of a variety of different types of molecules um, as, as far as what is that particular signal. We'll go over a specific example a little bit later in, in another um, lecture on a, an example of a very specific signal gated ion channel. For right now, Certain chemical molecules can tell an ion channel to open the gate or close the gate. So they may want to allow the flow of particular ions through, or they may need to stop or block the flow of particular ions through the membrane. Okay, So we have facilitated diffusion is where diffusion occurs through a protein. In this case, it's in the case of an ion moving through the protein, so we call it an ion channel. And the ion channel can either be opened or closed uh, based on this extension protein here, which is the gate. Uh, and the gate can respond to specific chemical signals. So that's one aspect. The second is charge. So charge gated ion channels are sometimes also called voltage gated. And so to talk about that, we also need to talk about uh, something else that's going on simultaneously. So at the same time, there's usually a lot of things happening. Um, and there's something going on called membrane potential that we haven't talked about yet. So membrane potential. Is the difference in charge across a membrane, so from one side to the other. So what that means is that inside the cell, if this is our cytoplasm, what we'll find is that the cytoplasm of the cell has an overall net negative charge. That net negative charge is actually uh, negative 70 milliamps. That's a difference in the charge from the outside of the cell, the extracellular side, that is largely more so positive in charge. So, you know, why is it negative? So, I'd like you to think about that. What sort of things make it negative? A lot of people come up with, oh, other ions, um, negative ions. And some, there are some there, but really it's it's all the functional groups of a lot of the biological molecules. The phosphate functional group, if you recall, is negatively charged. And we find that phosphate functional group in things like phospholipids. We find it in ATP. We'll find it in DNA and RNA. It's attached to proteins. We find a lot of phosphates are in, in the cell. Uh, there are the acidic, the carboxyl groups that are negatively charged. Okay, So we have those as charges. So there's a, there's a number of functional groups 
that have negative charges, and then they, there are a number of these very, very common molecules, they add to that, that negative charge. So this environment is negative, this environment is positive, and it tends to be stable at a particular measurable um, amount. That's called membrane potential, that difference, that's me measurable difference across the membrane. But membrane potential, sometimes in cells, can change or be altered. So we're going to go over a very specific example, and this is kind of like the beginning of it. So in your cells, you have an organelle called an endoplasmic reticulum. One of the nice things to say about eukaryotic cells is now we have many membranes. So this is a phospholipid bilayer to so the outer membrane. This is a phospholipid bilayer. I'm not going to redraw the whole thing, but that's a, an organelle. So like the endoplasmic reticulum, your mitochondria, your nucleus, they're all membranes made up of phospholipids, and they, they all create unique environments. They can have different pHs, different membrane potentials, different concentrations of other molecules, and they can store them away for unique uses. In this particular case, you're going to have in your cells, for example, a lot of calcium that's stored in the endoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum and the calcium is is positively charged as a plus two charge these calcium ions another signal gated ion channel one what we are going to talk about will respond to a particular signal molecule and when it does it will open up this gate and allow calcium ions to flood into the cytoplasm. That will change the membrane potential of the cytoplasm, change the charge, and then these charge-gated or voltage-gated ion channels will respond. They'll, again, open or close in response to try and maintain the original charge. So this is happening for a reason, but then it's going to trigger something else to occur. The cell is going to try to return back to its original state, so it's going to have to change again. So we have the ion channels can actually be sensitive to charge, so they could be told or know whether to open or close if that charge changes. Okay, so we have signal gated ion channels responding to a very specific chemical signal. Charge gated or voltage gated ion channels responding to changes in membrane potential. And then lastly we have uh, a type called stress gated and stress uh, is also mechanical. So mechanical. Uh, and that's sort of a, a physical stress to the, to the cell. So in muscle cells, for example, that change shape often, uh, they this little protein on the surface here now isn't going to bind a specific chemical molecule. It's going to respond more like a, a trigger mechanism. So it can actually be pulled or pushed open, and that will then relay the information to the gate. So the gate will either open or close based on the trigger being pushed one way or the other if the cell changes shape. So ion channels uh, are transmembrane proteins used in facilitated diffusion. Still diffusion, movement from high to low concentration, but in this case it's happening through a protein. And this example we're talking about is for the movement of ions. So these are called ion channels. So there are going to be a few other types of facilitated diffusion uh, we'll go over. The next type is with a type of protein called a carrier. And that's what we'll do next.